This was a prophet, a false prophet, some 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Why did they stone him? He made a mistake, probably. To the ancient Hebrews, a prophet was not his own man, he was God's man. To the ancient Hebrews, a prophet was a man believed to have been chosen by God, whose 
lips articulated the words of the source and power of the entire universe, whose eyes could foresee with uncanny accuracy events that would occur in years, sometimes centuries, to come. This poor fellow didn't make it, so he was stoned, the customary punishment for false prophets in those days. As a prophet, he may have been sincere. Most of the time, he was probably quite accurate, but to the ancient Hebrews, there was no room for error. A true prophet had to be accurate all the time. The early Hebrew kings were little more than nomadic tribal chieftains living in tents. They never created great pyramids like the pharaohs, or wonders like the hanging gardens of Babylon, or merchant fleets like the Phoenicians, or art like the ancient Greeks. No, what the Hebrews did do was to compile a collection of histories and prophecies that have influenced more people on this planet than any other book ever written. Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Lord God, look at me. I'm too young. I shall make my words a fire in your mouth. Everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. You say to a thing of clay, you are my father. Jeremiah was a little more than a youth when the Lord commanded him to speak to the people. Summoning up his courage, he went forth and proclaimed the truth that the people did not want to hear. He warned them against their evil ways and predicted the misfortunes that would come upon them. The Lord says, I am full of anger, and I cannot hold it back. My anger and my fury shall fall upon this place, on man, on beast, on trees, on crops. Because you have disobeyed me, I will send the king of Babylon against you. I will utterly destroy you. And this whole land shall be desolation and horror. And you shall be slaves in Babylon for 70 years. Archaeologists and historians confirm Jeremiah. Precisely as predicted, the Babylonians swept into Jerusalem and destroyed it. Those who survived were carried off to Babylon, where they remained for exactly 70 years. Of Babylon, one of the most powerful kingdoms of the ancient world, nothing remains. At a time when Babylon was considered impregnable to attack, the prophet Isaiah saw its total destruction by the Medes and Persians 150 years before it happened. Isaiah had also predicted that the first temple of Jerusalem, the one built by Solomon, would be destroyed by invaders. It was. He further predicted that a king named Cyrus would see to it that Jerusalem and its temples were rebuilt. Almost 200 years later, a king of Persia named Cyrus allowed his Jewish captives to return to the Holy Land and gave them the materials to rebuild their city and their temple. Jesus himself foresaw Jerusalem and its holy temple being destroyed a second time. The Roman legions fulfilled that prophecy in the year 70 AD. Jesus also predicted that the temple would be rebuilt for a third time on the same sacred site. Isaiah foretold of the Messiah, a man of sorrows, who would die beside criminals, and yet whose grave would be with the rich. 700 years after Isaiah's prophecy, Jesus was crucified between two thieves. And after his death, a man of wealth had him buried in his own tomb. 
Jesus, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Amos all predicted the destruction of the Jewish nation and the exile and persecution of its people. Their prophecies went so far as to foretell the restoration of the Jewish people as a nation. 3,000 years of history prove that the prophets of Israel spoke the truth. Not everyone wants to believe them. But they cannot be ignored. John, the son of Zebedee and beloved disciple of Jesus, lived his last days on the island of Patmos. Here he experienced visions beyond his understanding, which he set down in the last book of the Bible, called the Apocalypse, or Book of Revelation. like a trumpet and I saw one like a son of man his head and his hair were white as snow his eyes were like a flame of fire and his face was like the sun shining in full strength I looked and behold the sun became black as sackcloth the moon became like blood and every island fled away, and no more mountains were to be found. I saw a woman arrayed in purple and scarlet and bedecked with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations. And I saw the woman, the great city of Babylon, which has dominion over the kings of the earth, drunk with the blood of saints.
first angel poured his bowl forth on the earth, and foul and evil sores came upon the men. thing died that was in the sea. Hail and fire mixed with blood fell upon the earth and the sun was allowed to scorch the men with fire. And I saw the spirits performing signs to gather the kings of the world together for war in the place called Armageddon. the apocalyptic visions revealed to the disciple John are terrible indeed. 70% of all the prophecies written in the Bible have already been fulfilled. If the visions of the disciple John are truly prophetic, the remaining events are expected to be fulfilled in our lifetime. During the 2,000 years since John saw and recorded his visions of the apocalypse, man has advanced to the threshold of the space age. The course of his progress has been marked by great obstacles and appalling hazards. But each challenge has been met and every problem has been overcome as man advanced triumphantly into the 20th century. Now, on his lofty perch, as Lord of the Earth, man is faced by unprecedented perils that threaten to send him crashing into the dark abyss of silence known as extinction. What are these perils which could mean the end of human life on planet Earth? Are they real or imagined? Are they a matter of historical coincidence or divine prophecy? The prophets Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Zechariah all speak of a precise pattern of events that would come together just before the end of history in the great climactic war that will bring the Messiah. I believe that what we're seeing in the world today is the fulfillment of these ancient prophecies written between 2,000 and 3,500 years ago. As the world staggers from one crisis to another, I believe that we're racing on a countdown to the end of history as we know it. When we consider the prophecies of the Bible, it is important to realize that their meaning often becomes clear only after certain events have taken place. In a way, it's like a jigsaw puzzle that only makes sense after a key piece is in position. Prophecy has often been discredited in the past by misguided people 
who said the end of the world was at hand, or that the Messiah was coming. World War I saw many trying to fit the prophecies into that pattern. And then during World War II, there were many who thought that Hitler was the one the Bible predicted as the Antichrist. But the key to the whole prophetic pattern was missing. And that key has always been the rebirth of the state of Israel. Behold, I will open up your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel. In 1948, after almost 2,000 years of being scattered throughout the world, the Israelis miraculously re-established their state in Palestine. For believers throughout the world, Ezekiel's prophecy had been fulfilled, and the whole prophetic pattern began to fit together. In 1967, a second key piece fell into position. It was predicted that Jerusalem would be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled, and then it would fall back into Jewish hands. During the Six-Day War of 1967, this prophecy was amazingly fulfilled when the Israelis captured the old city of Jerusalem. For the first time in almost 2,500 years, the Jews were in sovereign control of the old city and the Wailing Wall, the last remnant of Solomon's temple. With the fulfillment of these two prophecies, the third condition relating to the end days takes on new significance. According to the prophets, the Temple of Solomon will be rebuilt on Mount Moriah before the final apocalypse overtakes mankind. The site of Solomon's Temple is now occupied by the Dome of the Rock, the second most sacred mosque in the Muslim world. How then can this prophecy be fulfilled? Before 1948, only a handful of people believed that the Jews would ever re-establish their nation in Palestine. The idea that they would return to the old city of Jerusalem was considered impossible. As we have seen, the prophecies of the Bible have a remarkable way of coming true. So who can say that the temple will not be rebuilt? According to Jewish law, it is forbidden to desecrate any place of religious worship. So if the Jews cannot touch the mosque, who can? There can be an earthquake. The Arabs might decide to move it elsewhere. In any event, for those who believe the prophets, the mosque will move and the temple will be restored on Mount Moriah. Over the last 2,500 years, Jerusalem has been under the control of the Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, Romans, the Turks, the British, and the Arab nations. Never until the events of recent history could the biblical prophecies about the end times have made sense. It was not until the oil crisis of 1973 that the full meaning of Zechariah's prophecy was revealed. Zechariah spoke of Jerusalem as a burdensome stone and said, all the nations of the world will be gathered against it. With Jerusalem now in Israeli hands, we can see very clearly how this could happen. With the world running out of cheap fossil fuels, oil has become the most powerful economic weapon on earth. As alternative sources of power run out, everyone will become totally dependent on Middle East oil. As the industrial nations are brought to their knees by the power crisis, the Arabs will use their political power to try and gain control of Jerusalem and the holy places. 
When they do this, Jerusalem will indeed become the burdensome stone prophesied by Zechariah, and all the nations of the world will become involved in the ensuing crisis, a crisis which will lead to the final battle of mankind in the valley of Armageddon. Is our planet truly in mortal peril? Can there really be any substance for all those biblical prophecies? In our investigations, we spoke to some of the world's leading scientists. This is the situation uh, of mankind. And uh, if we consider that uh, it has exploded, this situation, in the last 10, 15 years, uh, we uh, actually know that uh, we are a few minutes uh, uh, before possible disaster. The truth is that I am one of those scientists who finds it hard to see how the human race is to bring itself and bring the human enterprise much past the year 2000. It's later than most people think. Whether it's five minutes to midnight or whether it's ten minutes to midnight is debatable. I don't believe it. Emphatically not. I don't see it happening in that way. I'm not a fatalist in that respect. No. Well, I think the Earth has been here too long to all of a sudden just get up and just disappear. Oh. I think we'll go on living forever and ever. I think there will always be civilization, always. We'll make it. I won't be there. Is it pride, conceit, or ignorance that makes us feel invincible before nature? What is it that gives us the idea that our time on Earth is infinite and without end? The difficulty really is that um, so many people cannot absolutely envisage the possibility uh, of the extinction of the race. As a matter of fact, my own brother says he can't env envisage his own extinction. Speaking as a zoologist, I can't really look at mankind as anything other than one of the many different kinds of creatures that uh, I've examined. And, of course, one thing one knows immediately, as a zoologist, is that the human species one day will become extinct. I just don't want people to feel that they're here forever, that man is in some way different from other species. He's not. Uh, in this respect, he is just another animal. There are many grim reminders of past civilizations that were unable to survive in a changing environment. But these were relatively isolated societies, and when they failed, man was able to start again somewhere else. If modern civilization destroys itself, there won't be anyone left to pick up the pieces. The prophet Jesus said that in the end times, there would be all kinds of natural disturbances. And he said that they would increase in frequency and intensity, like the birth pangs of a woman when her child is about to be born. That's the key to the meaning and significance of these events. achievements of 20th century technology, we are constantly reminded of how helpless and puny man is before the forces of nature. If seismic and meteorologic conditions were stable, we could probably find a way to cope with them. But the number of earthquakes, measuring over seven on the Richter scale, have increased in each of the last five years. Recent earthquakes in Romania, Italy, China, the Philippines, and Guatemala have cost over a million lives.
It's the same story with tornadoes, floods, and our changing climate. As we contemplate nature's growing offensive, the question arises, is there some significance to all this? Some deeper meaning? Could these be the birth pangs the prophet spoke of? In Luke chapter 21, there are clear predictions about disturbances in space that will affect our atmosphere and change our weather patterns. It predicts that these disturbances will be so overwhelming that men's hearts will fail them for fear because of what is coming upon our world. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Scientists are now warning us of terrible dangers from outer space in 1982. In that year, Jupiter and all the other planets will be aligned on the same side of the sun. When this happens, they all pull together through gravity, producing a tidal influence on the sun and shaking up the surface of the sun, which makes the sun itself more active, produces sunspots, solar flares, and all the kinds of activity that we know the sun can produce, but more so. And when this happens, anything which is prone to earthquake activity, anything that's unstable, any volcanoes even that are sitting around waiting to be triggered into activity, they will be triggered. To imagine what will happen in 1982, one need only consider the last truly major volcanic eruption in history. The Tambora eruption of 1815 was equivalent to the explosion of 800,000 hydrogen bombs. It affected the world's weather for two years afterwards. With our increased population densities, the implications of an even larger eruption in 1982 Horrifying. Earthquakes, floods, changing weather patterns. These were all predicted by the ancient Hebrew prophets. As we examine the evidence, it's hard to escape the inevitable conclusion that what was predicted by Ezekiel, Daniel, Zachariah and Jesus thousands of years ago is happening right now before our very eyes. Another of the birth pangs is famine. In Revelation chapter 6, it says that a third part of mankind would be destroyed by famine and plague. As we look at the reality of our situation today, that is exactly what is happening. There's always been famine and disease in the world, but never on today's scale. Throughout India, Asia, Africa, and South America, we can see the beginnings of the fulfillment of this terrible prophecy. Conservatively, let's estimate that 5 million people starve to death annually. The actual estimates run between 2 and 20 million. I think 5 million is a very conservative estimate. Now, there are 365 days a year, so we divide 365 into 5 million, and that gives us, let's see, uh, about 14,000 people per day starving to death, uh, which means uh, from the time that you come into this movie until the time you walk out, probably about 1,000 people starve to death. Because we do not know how to control population growth, the momentum towards tragedy is growing. There is no way to stop it. People must die. Nobody likes to hear the brutal truth about famine. But according to the U.S. government figures, the demand for food in the world is already greater than the amount of food available. At the present time, there are 600 million people who are dangerously undernourished and 800 million living on less 
from 30 cents a day. The human population is growing exponentially at the present time. I'm a little over 40 years old, and when I was born, there were 2 billion people. Now there are 4 billion people. Uh, in another 35 years or so, if we're lucky, there's going to be 8 billion people. But I don't think we're going to be lucky. I think we're going to have a huge die-off before we reach 8 billion people. To most Americans and West Europeans, the thought of famine must seem a very remote possibility. But we do not live in isolation. And within a very short time, the problems of the third world will concern us all. With the population monster breathing down the back of our necks, the specter of war looms ever larger. It's very difficult to predict what a starving nation will do when it can no longer obtain food and faces the possibility of the death of a large part of its population. If it has atomic weapons at its disposal, the danger is that it will try to use them to secure food. This kind of situation could lead to a terrible holocaust. I'm speaking to you today from the last battlefield on planet Earth. It's out here that the last stages of history as we know it will be decided. We're told not only in the Bible what will happen here, but when. The exact sequence of events that will occur here are given in prophecy. The prophet Zechariah tells us that the soldiers who fight here will have a most unusual way of dying. First of all, the flesh will be consumed off of their bones the eyes consumed out of their sockets, and the tongue consumed out of their mouth. But the strange thing is, he says that this will all occur before they can fall to the ground. There's nothing like that except nuclear war. Prophets describe events of enormous destructive power, and yet no one understood them in ancient times. Now technologically we see how they could happen. I think one of the most amazing things is the book of Revelation. Here we have a man that speaks of being transported in almost a divine time machine into the future from the first century to almost the end of the 20th century. And he was told to write what he saw and heard. And yet, how could a first century man describe what he saw in the very advanced scientific and technological age that we're in? He had to go back into his own times and take from the phenomena from which he was familiar and uh, bring it into bear and, and try to describe these things in terms of the phenomena of the first century. From the throne issue flashes of lightning and voices, and peals of thunder, and great hailstones, heavy as a hundred pounds, dropped on men from heaven, till men cursed God for the plague of the hail. The sky vanished, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. incidences that indicates a nuclear holocaust is in Revelation chapter 8, where it speaks of John seeing something that looked to him like a meteor hitting the atmosphere, burning and flaming, and then hitting the earth. I believe he was describing beautifully exchange of intercontinental ballistic missiles, which look like a meteor when they re-enter the earth's atmosphere. When I began talking about these things in 1969, the stockpiles of nuclear weapons in the United States and the Soviet Union together made up the explosive equivalent of 15 tons of TNT for every man, woman, and child on the Earth. You might think that enough, but already unknown to us, unknown even to most of the members of our government, 
we were already well into the next escalation. And at present, our nation, the United States, is making three hydrogen warheads per day. We're on an escalator. I don't know how, as long as the Russians are pursuing a buildup and greater military might to get off that escalator. And I'm very much a pessimist about the future because I see no end to the arms race now in underway. And so I think that time is very short. But unless something very drastic is done to improve the situation, we're headed toward nuclear war. For the last 30 years, we have lived with the dangers of the Soviet-American arms race. But now we are faced with the growing peril of nuclear proliferation. We are now at the point where it is very likely that nuclear weapons will become available to an increasingly large number of nations. And uh, I think before the end of the century, probably even to some terrorist groups. The problem of a nuclear device falling into the hands of terrorists is a problem which must face the world today. It's a very real problem, it's very serious. And it could, in fact, directly affect major policies in the world because the use of such a weapon would not be in order to free somebody or achieve the immediate requirement of this group of terrorists. It would be in an endeavor to uh, change the policy, perhaps, of a major country. The earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. When Isaiah made this prophecy, pollution was unheard of. But now we know exactly what he was talking about. There's another prophecy in Daniel which says that in the end days, knowledge would increase. But this will not save man from destruction. As we take stock of our situation on planet Earth, there can be little question that our technology has advanced beyond our moral judgment of how to use it. For centuries, man has been raping the Earth without thought of the consequences. Now we are told that our natural resources will be exhausted by the year 2000. Where man will turn for alternatives, no one knows. Isaiah said that man would be punished for polluting the earth. And everywhere we look on our beleaguered planet, there's evidence that his prophecy is coming true. Our waters are now so polluted that they threaten the very air we breathe. It isn't generally realized that 80% of the oxygen we depend upon for respiration is created by the photosynthesis of algae in the upper levels of the ocean. Recent surveys have revealed that the amount of oil residue floating in those upper levels already exceeds the mass of all the algae. We cannot hide the fact that this could mean the end of all life on planet Earth. While oil residue is destroying the algae in our oceans, dozens of other poisons are working their way into our food chain. And now already in our food, uh, especially coming from the sea, we have a lot of poisons. For instance, we have mercury in the fishes. We also have uh, uh, antibiotics in the fish, for instance. And from the fish, it's going to the cattle, who very often now is fed with uh, fish proteins. As the poison substances appear in our food, we've come to realize only too late the dangers that we have created for ourselves.
Our generation is the first to have DDT in its liver, lead in its blood, mercury in its brain, asbestos in its lungs, and radioactive elements in its bones. If the average American was submitted to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for sale as food, he or she would not pass government standards as being fit for human consumption. Perhaps the strangest thing about all this is the way in which man is assisting in the process of his own destruction. It's almost as if we had an unconscious desire to see the biblical prophecies fulfilled. Consider the example of our vanishing ozone layer. It's a rather amazing thing. That ozone layer is the only thing that permits life to have come out from underwater in the course of evolution to exist out in the air. It's the only thing that permits the plants and the animals to live out on the surface of the earth. The reason is that the light of the sun contains short wavelength radiation that is incompatible with life and would kill all life if it were not screened out of the sunlight by that layer of ozone. That layer of ozone is fantastically delicate. If you were to bring it to what chemists call standard conditions, that is, zero degrees centigrade and one atmosphere pressure, that whole layer, that whole layer, would be three millimeters thick, so something like an eighth of an inch thick. And yet that's all that lies between us and not being able to go on living at the surface of the Earth. The prophecies of the end times speak of plagues and skin sores that correspond very closely with this condition. As the ozone layer begins to thin out, we can expect all kinds of dangerous developments, including a change in our weather and an increase in the incidence of skin cancer caused by sunburn. The killer bees of Brazil are an even more dramatic example of the ecological backlash that has come from man's arrogant disregard for nature. In 1956, it was decided to develop a new strain of bees in Brazil that would give an increased yield of honey. The motive, economic profit. The instrument, genetic science. For this purpose, the passive Brazilian honeybee was cross-fertilized with the aggressive and often vicious African bee. Experiments went on for some time until one day in 1957 when 26 African queen bees escaped from captivity. Since then, the African bees have been breeding so rapidly that they've become a menace all over Central and South America. The sting of the Africanized bees is twice as toxic as that of the normal domestic variety. And migrating in great swarms, these bees attack and kill anything in their path. As the bees spread north toward the United States, authorities are wrestling with the problem of how to stop them. As man advances in the science of genetics, a new horror appears on the horizon. Man is now subverting the very processes of creation itself. In the new biological era, we will be able to transplant organs, insert artificial organs, regrow, regenerate organs, so that the same human being uh, over a period of years may not be the same human being. All his parts will have been replaced and he'll have identity crises. We can manipulate reproductive biology. We can clone people from single cells. Uh, we can manipulate genes. We can control the brain and behavior. Uh, we can not only create any kind of people we want, we can, we can create creatures that never existed before on Earth. The amazing new technology of recumbent DNA enables us to recombine genes from any variety of organisms we wish. 
The problem is that nobody knows what will happen if one of these microorganisms escapes from a laboratory. Although they are unlikely to manufacture Frankenstein monster for a long time to come, there is a terrible danger that they will unwittingly release a virus against which mankind would have no defense. Could this be the curse which Isaiah predicted for those who transgress the law and break the everlasting covenant? DNA, pollution, famine, nuclear war. Man seems almost indifferent to the dangers ahead. In a world of growing atheism, is science the only hope for mankind? I feel that science can supply answers to most of the world's problems at present, the energy problem and uh, feeding the masses of people. I think that that can be done by science. I have a firm belief in the eventual use of the ocean to its full, full capacity for supplying food and other necessities of human existence on this planet. Oh, I think some scientists will come up with some kind of pills or something to take that will, that may solve the problem. <laughs> I think it's folly to expect science to pull a rabbit out of the hat in the 11th hour to solve uh, not only temporarily but for all time the food production problem. Anyone who plans their, their future on the hope that science and technology is going to solve this problem is planning their future on nothing more than wishful thinking. Modern man has been brought up to believe that science has the answer to all his problems. But now he sees it has failed him. Without belief, without religious faith, where can man turn for salvation? The reason why more people are turning to witchcraft or why it's so popular today is because it's a close kin to metaphysics and the healing arts and much of the psychic phenomena that everyone experiences. And now we live in a more enlightened age, so people are beginning to deal with it. They're beginning to read about it and eventually use it. The hour has come at last when the final circle may be cast is the hour behold the power of our will as the forces in the circle we bid thee still i believe astrology can definitely be used as a divinatory instrument one of the beauties of astrology is that it can be used in so many different ways i think one of the basic reasons that astrology is enjoying such a resurgence of interest today is that it is without question a marvelous tool for self-understanding and there is a general raising of the level of consciousness today people are interested in finding out about themselves in finding ways to develop and to grow and to make more constructive use of their lives and astrology is a wonderful tool for this according to recent estimates Astrology and the occult sciences are a $250 million a year industry. These practices were expressly forbidden by the laws of Moses, and yet the prophets predicted this would happen. They also warned that in the end times, there would arise false prophets and false religions. In John chapter 4, it says, Believe not every spirit but test the spirits, whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. For those who are aware of the biblical prophecies, the rising influence of Eastern gurus and their religions is yet another piece of the puzzle falling into place. So who are these gurus? Who do they represent? Sai Baba claims to be a messiah. He's absolutely unabashed about his claim that he's divinity in the flesh. He claims to be a Christ, the same as Krishna, the same as Ram. He claims to be the tenth incarnation of Vishnu, which is the Kalki avatar. Sai Baba is little known outside India, but there are other gurus who have immense followings throughout the world. 
one takes our attention to that inner region of bliss and fills the mind and heart with that bliss consciousness, comes out with more dynamic ability and more uh, happiness, more love, more harmony. So this message of transcendental meditation is a message to incorporate harmony and peace in the value of dynamism of life. The statistics are that millions of people are getting into transcendental meditation. They're doing it by believing the billboard that all TM is a simple method of relaxation that enhances intelligence and creativity. It's not a religious practice, no. That's why we call it a technique. It's a simple technique of tracing the finer state of thought and tracing the source of the thought within. However, when you get initiated, for some reason, you have to bring a flower and a white handkerchief and they recite something in a language you don't understand for about three minutes. It's a hymn. They give you a mantra to say silently in your head. It's an adoration. You're spending $120 to do something scientific, right? You're adoring a Hindu deity. And in polytheism, in the many deities of India, there must be hundreds and thousands of deities. It was my master who, 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 who gave me this ability to, to do this such great good to the world. All over the world we see a desperate spiritual hunger and self-styled messiahs offering us what they think we need. can see events falling into the prophetic pattern as the world drifts towards economic and political crisis many observers feel that conditions are ripe for the appearance of a world dictator a man who will seem to offer a solution to all the world's problems in this country of the imminence of some kind of military, political, authoritarianism, and I myself give it a good deal of belief. There's a great deal of prophecy about the Antichrist. 
Many people think that because this man's called the Antichrist that he'll appear to be evil. But Satan's no fool. According to the prophets, he comes as an angel of light frequently. And so uh, this man will appear to be a good man. And he will be accepted by the world, not just as a dictator, but as the very Messiah, the Savior of the world. If fascism ever comes to the United States, it'll be called Americanism. And I think that if we are going to have a fascist, totalitarian type of government or ruler in this country, he is going to be someone who exemplifies almost perfectly what we think of as the traditional American character. He's going to have elements of the rural in him, but he's not going to be, in any sense, a hick. He's going to be deeply populist in the sense that he will have to have a feeling of empathy. He will have to have a sense of attachment to the people to genuinely like them and for them to respond to him. He's going to have to be an individual who knows the military, likes the military, and is capable of using it. I believe this person the Bible calls the Antichrist, this great world dictator, is probably alive right now. He's probably going about his business unaware of his future fatal role in the history and destiny of mankind. He'll be a good man, probably an agnostic humanitarian. And Satan will give this man great intelligence, which he will interpret into the situation and uh, have real answers that answer big problems for the human race. Antichrist will get control, really, through uh, economic means. And uh, there's a prophecy in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, that speaks of him causing everyone to swear allegiance to him and receive a number and it says that no one can buy, sell, or hold a job without this number. Apparently, this dictator will cause everyone to swear allegiance to him as dictator and therefore uh, give them a number as they swear allegiance. Now stop and think about this for a minute. When could this prophecy have ever been fulfilled before in history beside today? The computer works on numbers. Uh, we already have a number. I, I'm sure you do. I have a number uh, in my bank. I think that we have other numbers, numbers on our um, passports and so on. I think eventually we will have one overall number, perhaps it will be the first part of the numerical code, which will identify us and we shall be known eventually by these numbers. The computer particularly lends itself to dictatorship. It's a wonderful instrument. The essence of any form of authoritarian or dictatorial government is surely to get the main facets of life under central control. The press, the power, the services, the police, the records, and industry as a whole, obedient to a central authority. And whoever controlled that would surely control the country. Computer technology has arrived on the scene at exactly the same point in history when all of the other prophecies are coming together simultaneously. There's one important point. How will we recognize the Antichrist when he arrives on the scene? The scriptures give us an important clue. Let him who hath understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man, and the number is six hundred and sixty-six. In ancient times, a person's name had a fixed numerical value. This was because the letters of the alphabet were also used as numbers. For centuries, scholars and numerologists have puzzled over this prophecy. Symbolically, six is said to be the number of man in the scripture and a triad, or three, is the number of God. When you triple six, it is the symbol of a man making himself God.
of technology available, the search for an explanation has been intensified. We do not know whether the prophecy refers to the Antichrist's real name, his assumed name, or even his title. No one will really know who he is until he receives a mortal wound from which he will appear to be raised from the dead. It's this that kind of thrusts him on the stage of history and everyone will be uh, mesmerized by, you know, this thing that appears to be a great miracle. And for all I know, it may be a miracle, only it'll be done by the power of Satan. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. <laughs> John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King. Three traumatic political assassinations. It's not difficult to imagine the effect if a prominent leader were to be struck down and then raised from the dead. The impact would be incredible. According to the book of Revelation, this is exactly how the Antichrist will come to power. Prophet Jesus predicted that there would be wars and rumors of wars as the end times approached. Year after year, we've seen wars and revolutions erupting around the globe with increased frequency and magnitude. We can see where this is leading, but we seem helpless to stop it. The prophets say that it is our fear of war and lack of faith that will make it possible for the false messiah to be accepted. By promising us the peace and security our hearts crave after, this Lord of darkness will become dictator of the world, and he will lead us into the terrible end days. The biggest question, I think, that people are asking today is how will we know that we're in the end times? How will we know that we're in the days that lead to the coming of the Messiah and to the great holocaust that's to precede it? The book of Revelations focuses on a seven-year period of history which will culminate in the holocaust of Armageddon. But before the seven-year countdown can begin, there are definite political alignments that the prophets mention and which we should examine in closer detail. According to the prophet Ezekiel, shortly after the restoration of the Jewish people in the land of Israel, a deadly enemy will arise to its uttermost north. Ezekiel identifies the northern commander as Gog of the land of Magog. He was also prince of an ancient people called Rosh, Rus. By careful research, biblical scholars have been able to trace and identify these people as the ancestors of the dreaded Scythians. Greek and Roman historians speak of the Scythians as a barbaric people who lived in the northern regions above the Caucasus Mountains. These barbarians are generally recognized as the ancestors of the people who inhabit modern Russia. In the light of the rise of Russia as a world power, Ezekiel's prophecy is incredible. It coincides almost exactly with the rebirth of the nation of Israel, and it is totally accurate in regard to Russian ambitions in the Middle East. Soviet objectives in the Middle East are to increase their geopolitical influence to tighten their stranglehold on the oil supply of the West, to have access to the warm water ports to which they have always aspired, 
and to be able to complete the encirclement of communist China. Ezekiel goes on to identify a second power block that will be allied to Russia. He says that Egypt will head a confederation of Arab and black African states against the restored nation of Israel. As we note, Russia's military presence in the Middle East, Ezekiel's prophecy reads like a blueprint of the current situation. If you read the various prophecies about Armageddon at the end days, and you're aware also of the, the realities of the situation in the Middle East. It certainly does not look out of place. It doesn't say what age, it doesn't say when, but it does give you a ratio of forces, a given political situation, which when we read it in the context of situation even today, uh, does uh, begin to appear familiar. In yet another prophecy concerned with political alignments in the end days, John foretells the rise of modern China. The rise of China coincides with the rise of Russia as a world power. And both these developments coincide with the return of the Jewish nation to Israel. In a detailed and graphic description, John tells us that in the end times, the Chinese will bring an army of 200 million men across the Euphrates River and into the Middle East. Military sources now estimate the size of the People's Army as 200 million men under arms, the exact figure predicted in Revelations. Could all this be coincidence? Or did the ancient prophets know more than we do today? We have now identified three of the four great power blocks that will be involved in the events that lead to Armageddon. This leaves us to discover the fourth entity, the confederation of ten nations that will be led by the Antichrist. In one of the most dramatic passages in the Old Testament, Daniel had a vision of four beasts emerging from the sea. Each beast represented a great empire of the future, the Babylonian, the Persian, the Greek, and the Roman Empire. He was told that each of these would rise and fall, but then out of the remnants of the Roman Empire, a ten-nation confederacy would emerge, and this revival of the Roman Empire would be led by the Antichrist. For centuries, there's been conjecture about this prophecy. Some thought that Charlemagne might be the one to rebuild the empire. Then came Napoleon, but neither could fulfill the exact conditions of the prophecy. As we survey the biblical prophecies and measure them against present events, it is hard to deny the weight of evidence that is building up. If these are the end times predicted by the prophets, then we can expect the missing pieces of the prophetic puzzle to rapidly fall in place. In 1957, an event occurred that could mark the beginning of the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. On May 25th of that year, six nations gathered in Rome to sign a treaty which laid the foundation of the European common market. Since 1957, the common market has expanded to nine nations and there are strong indications that a tenth nation will be added in the near future. Could this be the ten-nation confederacy that Daniel spoke of, the successor of the Roman Empire? We cannot at this moment be certain, but taken in the context of biblical prophecy, it is a significant development. As we have seen, Jerusalem is the key the future of mankind. Ever since the Israelis captured it in 1967, we have had a perpetual crisis in the Middle East. This fulfillment of the prophecies displaced Arabs who had dwelt in Palestine for centuries. 
The Jews will never be convinced that they should leave the land that God gave to their forefathers. They believe that they were robbed of their inalienable right to the land by the Romans. Centuries of persecution have shown that there's no country in the world where they can be assured of continuing acceptance, much less safety. During the Second World War, six million Jews were exterminated in Europe. And this is something that no Jew can ever forget. Therefore, the return to Israel is not only a fulfillment of the biblical prophecies, but a matter of survival in a hostile world. The Arabs are equally implacable in their unwillingness to accept the Israeli occupation of what they consider to be their land. It has become a matter of national honor and religious duty to drive out the Israelis. As political events continue to fall into the prophetic pattern, the big question becomes, when will the seven-year countdown begin? According to Daniel, the Middle East crisis will escalate to the point where the peace of the whole world will be threatened. At this crucial moment in history, the Antichrist will appear, and as leader of the Ten Nation Confederacy, will sign a mutual defense pact with Israel. The moment that this treaty is signed, the countdown will begin. The situation, the way it is in the Middle East today, we hear a lot of talk about making Israel give up her captured Arab territories in return for guarantees by the United States or the United Nations. Although there are great pressures being put on Israel to make these concessions, there are many observers who warn against it. We have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we in agreement. These were the words of Isaiah, who said that Israel will sign a pact with the Antichrist, and this will be the beginning of the end. By solving the Middle East crisis, the Antichrist will be hailed as the savior of mankind. In Revelation, the prophet John says that the Antichrist will dominate the world for 1260 days. There will be a period of great economic expansion and people will praise the Antichrist for bringing them the peace and the prosperity they all hunger after. But then, without warning, the war that everyone has been dreading will erupt in the Middle East. Seeking to take advantage of their dominant economic position, the Arabs will attack the state of Israel. Reacting to this development, the Russians will sweep into the Middle East and occupy the Holy Land. There will be a great host, a mighty army, like a cloud, covering the land. Then, Daniel says, the king of the north will stretch out his hand against Egypt and her allies. In other words, Russia will double-cross the Arabs and occupy their territories, gaining control of the world's major oil supplies. At the same time, Communist China, identified in the Book of Revelations as the kings of the East, begins to mobilize an army of 200 million men. As the forces of East and West move into the Middle East, the stage will be set for the final battle of history, the confrontation man has been dreading for centuries, the fulfillment of the prophecy of Armageddon. Let all the men of the war draw near, let them come up, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the Valley of Decision.
new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. This generation shall not pass till all these things take place.